So, so is the bar, you know, and I guess the real crux comes down to is, you know, what constitutes really damaging information? I mean, right. genuinely damaging. Is the bar, and, and, and now it is, uh, you, you're saying essentially that technology has all but made obsolete the idea of enjoining uh, a, a publishing uh, house or entity from publishing this stuff because it happens so quickly that there's literally no time to enjoin uh, someone from publishing that. Is the bar different? I mean, is the is the um, it, it, it does the the plaintiff in, in this case obviously the United States or the prosecution in this case the United States is the bar different? from enjoining uh, a publishing uh, entity from publishing this stuff as opposed well, the, bar, the no the bar may be uh, a little easier to jump uh, but uh, y your listeners all know uh, from grade school high school so forth that there is a test called clear and present danger if the publication causes a clear and present danger to the national security of the United States then uh, depending on the circumstances, the government could come in and say, okay, you're going to go to jail. So, for example, if you look at Snowden and ask about all his publications with respect to the uh, telephone metadata program and so forth and so on, uh, what your listeners ought to do is, well, did the publication of that uh, damage immediate, uh, was, uh, constitute a clear and present danger to United States. And I think that uh, the president has concluded that it didn't, or else he wouldn't be asking for a debate on uh, whether we should be doing it or not. But that's, that's what the bar is, to answer your question today. And, and so let me ask you this. I mean, based upon how aggressive, and I want to talk about the, sort of the recent history of how aggressive uh, the uh, Obama administration has been, whether it's um, uh, in, in its use of the Espionage Act, if you were to receive those Pentagon papers today, and you were, um, you know, I guess uh, at the time it was you, you went into uh, – uh, the law books. I don't know if uh, uh, Lexus Nexus was not around at that time, um, but uh, if you were to go and look at the um, uh, whether or not there was uh, liability implications for the uh, New York Times today, based upon the recent history of the use of the Espionage Act, w would your assessment be the same? Well, I think you'd have to have a little more courage uh, than you had before because. Uh, as you imply, uh, the Obama administration has been using uh, the Espionage Act, uh, in, in my view, at a drop of a hat, which is to say that uh, they've used the espionage uh, uh, six times to indict leakers and uh, a seventh time to charge one. That would be uh, Snowden. Now, that's not charging as I say, Leakey, the, the publisher. But uh, you would be sitting there today with the Pentagon Papers knowing that the government thought it had a real live uh, law, uh, the Espionage Act, even though, as I told your listeners earlier, the law had dropped out of the Pentagon Papers case. After that, uh, the previous administrations tried to use it three times against leakers, and Obama, seven, as I've said. So you're going to ask yourself, well, gee, it's being used against leakers. I wonder if it can be used against publishers, leakies. And uh, Obama uh, doesn't give me any confidence that he's not going to do it. Uh, there is this case instance, which perhaps we all remember, of a, a Fox News, mm -hmm. Mr. Rosen. James Rosen. And James Rosen. And in that case, the Justice Department, which is Obama's apartment, went in and told the court that Rosen, who is a leaky, who is a leaky of a leak from a, a gentleman who was telling him about Korea, uh, was a co-conspirator with a person who leaked. Now, that may sound like fancy language, but you're asking me if I'm sitting there looking at the papers today, would I be concerned about what Obama's been doing? Yes, he's been using it against leakers, 
and he did use it against uh, poor Mr. Poor Mr. Rosen, and I have no confidence that he's not going to use it against uh, WikiLeaks or any of these new kind of uh, digital publications. So I think the decision would be harder. And, and when you look at the um, uh, the trial of uh, of Bradley Manning and the uh, the 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 government's argument that it would have made no difference if Manning had uh, provided this information directly to the New York Times or any other publication, uh, you know, that we consider to be traditional traditional media, as opposed to WikiLeaks, um, in terms of their uh, theory that uh, Manning uh, was guilty under the Espionage Act. Um, w w where does that rest? In other words, when you're assessing, if you're that attorney today inside the New York Times and you're assessing the risk to the New York Times, when you look at the cases of, of James Rose and when you look at the uh, subpoenaing, the secret subpoenaing of the um, the AP, um, uh, the AP records. When you see uh, uh, that James Risen has been uh, compelled to testify, uh, or, or you know the the attempt is to c compel him to testify. Uh, when you see the ongoing um, uh, a grand jury, which we believe we have every reason to believe is c continuing uh, to seek an indictment against uh, Julian Assange. Uh, and then uh, the, 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 the theory um, uh, propagated by the government in the Amani case. Of those different instances, what is the most alarming to you? In other words, what is the hierarchy? Is, is something being built here that leads to um, a, a, uh, a theory that the leaky is, um, is legally culpable? Well, I think that uh, where we're headed, I don't want to confuse the issue by talking about Great Britain, but Great Britain has an official secrets act, which means the leaker and leaky can be both thrown in the jug. And I think uh, you ask what's being built here. Uh, what is being built, in my judgment, is something very much like uh, what they're going to have in England. And uh, if you look at Manning, Manning was... Uh, thought to have uh, uh, been subject to trial as a traitor, uh, that that dropped. Uh, we look at uh, Risen, who must be distinguished from a Rosen. It's like a Shakespeare play, isn't it? <laughs> uh, anyway, he uh, uh, has now been uh, uh, compared to a person who witnesses a crime any time he talks to someone with uh, classified information. And as lastly, we look at the grand jury, which is sitting there to pounce on Julian Assange, should he ever come to this country. He add it all up, and the pincer is closing. And I think that the bottom line is going to be, unless we fight like hell, and my book is called Fighting for the Press, uh, we're going to end up with a government that's going to be able to control its information in a criminal way, uh, in a fashion that was absolutely thought unthinkable when I first looked at those Pentagon papers X years ago. It's interesting that you mentioned the UK's Official Secret Act, because in the Atlantic uh, Monthly, Amadi uh, Etzioni, who is a... Um, who served as an advisor to the Carter White House and uh, is supposedly um, at least um, somewhat unofficially advising uh, the Obama uh, White House, uh, made a case for, um, uh, for actually more, I guess, intimidation of whistleblowers in some respect. And one of the, 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 his key arguments is that why should we trust the media uh, to make this determination about clear and present danger, uh, as opposed to the uh, the the government. I mean, uh, he also makes the point, which is you know sort of in, in your instance uh, not terribly applicable. But he says, uh, in one in the other corner, this is uh, you know squaring off between government and the media is a person who likely never served in the armed forces, has no training in assessing the limited intelligence material, whichever comes his way. You, of course, uh, did have that, that type of training, but there is a good argument that uh, there are less people like, um, uh, like James Goodell who are in these um, 
uh, these media outlets on some level, I think that probably intimidates people in these media outlets. But but give me your response to that notion that we should be trusting well, the in, in part. Uh, I mean, he's someone who argues that point of view who's in government always has an upper hand because they know things you don't know. But it goes to the nature of, of intelligence, and the public has been bollocked by this nat- notion uh, forever. But intelligence uh, that we're talking about is not the disclosure of a spy in Iraq. Uh, uh, it's not the disclosure of an atomic bomb secret in the ordinary course. If it's really secret, I would suggest it doesn't get leaked. What we're talking about is information that's been collected from publications and observations that are public. And if such information uh, is uh, collected in that fashion, when it comes back to you with a classified stamp on it, uh, surely uh, you can sit there as a common-sense person and make some uh, judgment as to whether that type of information constitutes a clear and present danger. And in any event, you should have the right to test it out. It's not as though you want to stop somebody from uh, publishing it to begin with, which was the, what the Pentagon Papers case is all right. You know, you got a First Amendment right to get the stuff out. And, as the implication is in the article of which you speak, you do it wrong because you don't know enough, well, you're going to be up the uh, creek. And uh, your case will then be used for other cases. But there never have been any such cases. So I would argue that um, the claims that are made for national security, the expertise that goes along uh, with them, um, is highly overstated. Give me your assessment. I mean, uh, in the past couple of weeks, we had a um, a report that was uh, from various media outlets, including, I think, McClatchy, Washington Post, uh, about... Uh, uh, that triggered the closing of the embassies. There was clearly leaks, uh, some in the United States and some coming out of Yemen, regarding the intelligence, uh, the means in which we gathered the intelligence that that caused the embassy leaks across uh, across the world. Twenty embassies, uh, all of which have been reopened, short of uh, the one in Yemen, as far as I know. And. One of the stories that came out of that was that the New York Times had this information. They had it on a Sunday. They were asked by the government not to print this, uh, but in fact, the information was then printed uh, the next day, I think, by McClatchy in the Washington Post from what appears to be two different sources. Um, wh- give me your assessment as to, one, um, where the New York Times is in and how aggressive they are in, in, in printing this stuff. And two, uh, if you think that there has been a chilling effect uh, or, 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 or what the danger is for a chilling effect in, in regarding to uh, media outlets reporting on this stuff. Well, uh, on the first one, uh, the, the facts are hard to define, uh, particularly, but uh, I am so cynical uh, that I am very uh, doubtful that everything that the government said about the Yemen situation, which led to the closing of the embassies, was in fact as uh, dangerous uh, as it uh, said. It ultimately disclosed the method of the intelligence, which was the interception of a phone call from Zawiri to a Yemen reader, a leader rather, uh, the government never discloses its method. I, I only can think that uh, cynically it disclosed the method to uh, emphasize its case, how clear the case was, but at the same time, you don't do it that way, and I wonder if they ever had had a case. And that's what the sort of analysis I think you you have to make uh, when you get that information, which was your, your, your first question. Uh, the second question is uh, what impact does – all of the above have on the uh, ability to cover this information in the first place, and is there a a chilling effect? I think that the the more the government makes it uh, 
look uh, criminal uh, to uh, uh, cover and publish this information makes it criminal in the case of James Risen uh, to uh, talk to somebody who is uh, uh, has access to classified information, uh, treats Rosen as a co-conspirator, uh, chases uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, I think that is a chilling effect, and in the real world, is not going to encourage reporters of whom we have very few, to tell the truth, who cover national security, to go out and, and cover it. Why the hell they want to? Why do they want to do that? They're going to be called criminals. Uh, they're going to be harassed, and God knows how much uh, information the government's going to get from their internet. I think I'd choose another line of work. So if we don't have enough reporters who cover this stuff, uh, it, it perforce means that uh, it's 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 been all been chilled because there's no way to get the stuff out. Specifically, I mean, let me ask you about the New York Times decision not to publish that. I mean, do you perceive the Times, um, where do you rate them relative to um, how uh, bold they were in, um, in, in reporting on the Pentagon Papers? In other words, um, why is it that the Times would have held that back but McClatchy wouldn't? Is that indicative of something that we should be concerned about? Well, I, I think that it would be a mistake to assume that newspapers or publications for journalists uh, report and publish on everything they have because they edit out must edit out stuff all the time. And before the Pentagon Papers, the Times had uh, not published uh, stories. And the general reason for so doing was the determination that they constituted a clear and present danger. So... Uh, I think that that judgment uh, is made uh, from editor to editor uh, through the course of time, and each editor is going to look at it uh, somewhat uh, differently. But I think that implicitly they have a bar in the mind and uh, will uh, you know, decide not to publish if they think that under a particular circumstance it's going to damage uh, uh, a particular operation or or whatever. So do, I do can't you think, make any let me, let me. Is that the only calculus? I mean, in other words, is it well, is, is there another yeah, calculus know. that perhaps um, we the 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 risk in publishing this is not simply that it may or may not be a clear and present danger to the United States, but it's also that it may implicate our access and our relationship with a given administration so that we wouldn't have access to other stories that we might have access to. In other words, yeah. we'll trade yeah, off it. this, uh, you know, we'll let McClatchy scoop us on this one so that we have access to other stories down the road. Well, you know, I, I've never understood how reporters like you do your job, because every time I try to do it, I find it impossible. I mean, how do you, how do you on the one hand, attack the hell out of somebody, and on the uh, other hand, uh, uh, cozy up to that person to cause a leak, say, for example. So if you're asking me in the real world, would uh, a newspaper, would uh, the New York Times, for example, put off publication uh, of a particular matter because it would destroy their relationship w with the sources? I mean, I like to think that never happens, but uh, reporters are human beings, so I suppose it enters into the calculation. Well, I should just say for uh, for clarification's sake that nobody tells me anything. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm, <laughs> sadly, I'm not very cozy with anybody, so it's it's less of a uh, a difficult calculation for me to make. Um, but um, uh, James Goodell, uh, the the uh, the the book is fighting for the press. We will put a link up at uh, Majority FM. Uh, the inside story of the Pentagon Papers and other battles. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. <laughs>